listeners. I'm Russell, and this is Voice Over Work, an audiobook sampler. Where do you listen? Today is March 12th, 2023. In describing his recent audiobook, The Lifelong Learner, Peter Holland says, it's about accomplishing your goals. The skill of learning is so valuable in life because without it, you're stuck in place exactly where you are right now. No growth, no development, and nothing accomplished. This book is how to become a self-sufficient learner that's capable of creating their own syllabus, directing their learning journey, retaining information, and applying it to real-life situations, all without the pressure of a teacher or tests. Thanks for joining us again. This episode is the chapter-by-chapter preview of Peter Holland's book, The Lifelong Learner. Chapter 1, From Comfort Zone to Growth Zone Humans have a startling tendency to gravitate toward the mundane, the monotonous, the known. It's very easy for us to get stuck in a rut. If we're not careful, we can find ourselves years into a job or a relationship that we loathe simply because it's comfortable. Comfort zones litter all aspects of our lives. But what exactly do they entail? Judith Bardwick, a management theorist, used the term comfort zone in her 1991 work, Danger in the Comfort Zone. She postulates that the comfort zone is a behavioral state in which a person functions in an anxiety-free state, employing a limited set of behaviors to achieve a consistent level of performance, typically without any perception of risk. Simply put, a comfort zone is an area where you feel safe and secure. It's familiar territory where you know what to expect. Think of it as the inside of your house. It's familiar, safe, and secure. The fear zone is the space just outside your house where you feel a bit anxious and uncertain. Stepping outside of your house and out into the fear zone can be scary, but it's also how you will tackle new challenges continuously learn new skills, and get things done. As the fear zone is daunting and scary, it's natural to be a little anxious. But if you persevere and push through, you'll enter the learning zone. This is where your skills will blossom and obstacles will become opportunities for growth. When it comes to lifelong learning, Having the courage to leave your comfort zone can open up new possibilities and opportunities. Stepping outside of our normal routines enables us to look at things with a different perspective and gain new insights, making us more flexible in both our thinking and approach to new situations. Embracing the unfamiliar terrain of leaving our comfort zones also helps us build confidence and strengthen our resilience so that we can continue growing and learning for the rest of our lives. Eventually, this newfound knowledge learned means your comfort zone has expanded even further. Congratulations, you have now entered the growth zone. It's time to live your dreams, realize your aspirations, set new goals, and find your purpose. While it's comfortable to stick with what you know, and just stay cuddled up in your comfort zone forever. That doesn't mean it's necessarily good for you. Psychologists believe that spending too much time in our comfort zones can lead to boredom or stifle learning and personal growth. Sometimes it's necessary to step outside of your comfort zones in order to learn new things or challenge ourselves. Abraham Maslow's theory of self-actualization posits that humans have an innate need to reach their full potential. This can only be done by challenging oneself and pushing beyond one's comfort zone. Therefore, to truly become self-actualized, we must be willing to take risks and face our fears. When you think of a successful, intellectual and talented individual, who comes to mind? Perhaps someone like Thomas Edison, the American inventor, whose advancements to the light bulb made it a symbol of brilliance? But 
despite being a very clever and talented guy. Chapter 2. Passion and Motivation for Lifelong Pursuits Achieving something that once seemed impossible is such an amazing feeling, and learning to do so involves stepping out of your comfort zone. Sure, it can be intimidating at first. A lot of us have experienced failure or had difficulties in the past and aren't eager to face it head on. But understanding that growth comes from pushing yourself beyond your limits and embracing challenges will go a long way on your journey. Instead of dwelling on your inability to learn and grow, aim for progress by reframing failures as just a part of the process. It shows that you're trying. As you move ahead and start searching for your ultimate passion, you can look back with pride, knowing that you took those initial steps forward yourself. But how do we initiate that internal drive to pursue what is most important to us? How do we ignite our intrinsic motivation to reach our passions? As a young, curious, wide-eyed girl, Jane loved nothing more than exploring the world around her. She was constantly asking questions and trying to figure out how things worked. Nothing could dampen her thirst for knowledge and learning new things. Her parents were always impressed by her intelligence and creativity, and they did their best to encourage her natural curiosity. One day, when Jane was about ten years old, she came across a book on physics in her parents' library. She quickly became fascinated by the concepts it described, the beguiling images of the cosmos, theories on time travel and time dilation, the quirkiness of quarks, the peculiar behavior of matter and light. She spent hours reading about the laws of motion and energy. Soon enough, Physics became Jane's favorite subject in school. She loved learning about the universe and discovering new ways to understand it. Throughout high school and college, Jane continued to study physics with enthusiasm. She even started doing research in quantum mechanics, which was one of the most complex fields of physics, but no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't seem to break into that field as a researcher. Finally, after years of frustration, Jane decided to take a different approach. Instead of focusing purely on her own ambitions, she started helping other students learn physics. She expanded her skill set and found that she enjoyed teaching just as much as researching, and eventually became a professor at a major university. Jane's story is a great example of how intrinsic motivation can turn us into lifelong learners hell-bent on discovering our true passion. We all have experienced intrinsic motivation at some point. Think about a time when you lost track of time because you were completely absorbed in what you were doing. Maybe it was painting, playing an instrument, reading a book, or organizing your closet. Intrinsic motivation is often driven by a sense of satisfaction, pride, or achievement. Alternatively, it could be something you find enjoyable or fun. For example, many people are intrinsically motivated to exercise because they enjoy the endorphin rush that comes with it. By staying curious, intrinsically motivated, and following her instincts, Jane ended up finding something that made her incredibly happy. Intrinsic motivation is essential for lifelong learning. This type of motivation fuels the desire to keep learning and exploring new things, even if it's outside. Chapter 3. Using WHOOP to Set and Achieve Your Goals Setting goals is key to any form of learning and personal growth. By setting goals, you can focus your energies in the right direction, as well as see clearly how far you've come and what steps still need to be taken. Establishing a timeline for your goals also helps keep you motivated and on track, making sure that nothing slips through the cracks. When a goal is strategically set, it serves as a powerful tool for guiding progress, allowing us to map out our journey and develop our skills along the way. Goals empower us intrinsically with both insight and structure, enabling us to not only build knowledge, but foster confidence in ourselves and all we are capable of achieving. Let's learn how to set and achieve your goals. When you start something with a set goal in mind, 
it's natural to be optimistic about the outcome. You're learning how to surf, and you're confident you'll be standing up and coasting through waves in no time. You start taking painting lessons, and you can't wait to make artwork worth hanging up in your house. Or you bought a bike, and you're already thinking about all the ways you're going to ditch all other modes of transportation. Beginning a new task with optimism can be really helpful. It's certainly better than going into something thinking you're doomed to fail. But positive thinking can only get you so far. Nobody's perfect, and you're bound to make a few mistakes on the road to achieving your goals. Beyond that point, you'll need a lot more than beginner's enthusiasm to keep you going. You're going to spend your whole life learning. It's the foundation for self-improvement. In order to keep yourself learning, though, you need a clear and intelligent strategy. You also need to know exactly what you want. Cultivating these wishes and aims will let you see the progress you've made and your future more clearly. In order to commit yourself to lifelong learning, you need to figure out what you'll be learning in the next year or two. It sounds obvious, but many of us embark on complicated projects of self-improvement without a clear sense of what it is we're actually trying to achieve in the first place. That's why it's important to set goals and to achieve what you set out to do. Even if you don't achieve your goal, or achieve it only partly, you can still feel good about yourself and your abilities, and you'll know exactly what you need to do next to keep striving. But when you're first beginning to think about what you want to learn, you only think about the good things you'll gain. You're fixated on the outcome, which, although understandable, is precisely what will make you abandon your efforts when you hit that first roadblock. For example, your goal is to lose weight. The thing that inspires you to embark on this goal is fast-forwarding to that glorious moment at the end when you're feeling light and healthy and proud of yourself. But when the number on the scale is stubbornly refusing to move for the third week in a row, it's hard to tap into those same positive feelings that got you inspired to begin with. Instead, you focus on the present negative feelings and tell yourself that dieting makes you miserable and exercising doesn't work, and you give up on your plan. The problem wasn't that the scale didn't budge for three weeks. The problem was that you were unprepared to deal with the fact that change takes time. Because your head was filled with all the good feelings of what life would look like after your goal was reached, you actually made yourself less resilient to the challenges inherent to the process before you met your goal. In other words, your optimism actually worked to... Chapter 4. Self-education begins and ends with questions. It's all too easy to take what we've been taught at face value, never really questioning our understanding and getting hung up on the details. Learning how to critically question our own thinking and understanding can open doors that turn tedious information into untapped potential. When we learn how to learn for ourselves, it not only keeps our intrinsic motivation alive by unearthing knowledge rather than waiting for someone else to spoon-feed it, but it also helps us find gratification in everything from small victories to larger solutions that offer insights into what truly means something to us, our passions. Taking a step back every once in a while and asking ourselves, why am I doing this, and how can I be better at this, can be an invaluable tool when growing into our greatest selves. Let's look at how we can improve our learning strategies and learn how to learn. Kai was a bright and talented student, but he'd always found it hard to focus. He'd drift off during classes, struggle to stay motivated when given an assignment, and never quite get the grades he knew he was capable of. His teachers were supportive, but they couldn't seem to help him break through his own mental blocks. Kai never asked questions in class, even if he knew he needed the clarification. When Kai's parents noticed how frustrated he was becoming with himself, they decided it was time for a change. They enrolled him in a special program that promised to teach students how to become better learners by developing their self-awareness and sharpening their critical thinking skills. 
At first, Kai wasn't sure if this program could really make any difference in his academic performance. After all, how did asking himself questions have anything to do with getting good grades? And it was fine that he didn't pose any questions in class. He could just go home and reread the chapter or something. It all seemed very pointless. But as the weeks went on, and Kai began putting into practice the lessons from the program, such as learning how to ask yourself and others questions about topics like, why am I having trouble understanding this concept? What strategies can I use here? How can I remember this information more effectively? Can you please elaborate on this with an example? Something began changing inside of him. He slowly developed greater insight into why certain things felt so different for him before. Now, armed with new tools at his disposal that allowed him to explore these issues from different perspectives, progress came much easier than ever before. As each day passed, Kai felt his confidence grow stronger and stronger until eventually there no longer seemed any obstacle too daunting or a problem too complex for him to tackle head-on. Kai is now thriving in school, thanks largely to being able to develop powerful, self-questioning habits for effective self-education. The habits enable him to confront every challenge with newfound enthusiasm, find out answers to his questions, and communicate with his teachers more effectively, thus proving, once again, just how important asking the right questions is in taking control of your own journey toward lifelong learning. A study revealed that self-questioning procedures greatly increased... Chapter 5. The Sacred Life-Changing Habit of Reading It's no secret that reading has been touted as the key to unlocking a world of knowledge and expanding your intellectual capacity. By building a habit of daily reading, you can stay informed on current events, learn more about a particular subject, or maybe even get intrinsically motivated to reach those big goals. Doing so also helps open your mind to new ideas, prepares you for unfamiliar scenarios, and gives you the skills to succeed in almost any situation. It's no wonder many successful people cite reading as one of the best ways to achieve success and become smarter. So, if you're looking for a way to accelerate your learning experience and reach your goals faster, then making a habit of daily reading is definitely worth considering. Ask any permanent student of life or successful autodidact what their most consistent habit is, and you may find they give you the same answer, reading. Reading is something that we all know is good for us but it's also something that we often have mountains of excuses for not doing. You've probably had at least one of these excuses when it comes to not reading more. I just don't have the time. I don't have the patience. And perhaps the most common, I just don't know where to start. These are all valid excuses, but the key to becoming an effective daily reader is in your hands. Once you learn to employ some of the methods experts advocate to become a daily reader, you'll find that reading opens up a whole new world for you, making you a better person in the process. You'll find that your mind is stimulated and your curiosity about the world is piqued. Perhaps most important, becoming a daily reader will help you appreciate both sides of every argument and be more critical of facts you already know or think you know. And in today's world, where everyone seems to have the my way or the highway philosophy, Looking at things from all sides is a skill in short supply. How do we squeeze more reading into our lives? Take advantage of free time. There's no doubt we live in a fast-paced, hustle-and-bustle world. Family commitments and careers take up most of our time, so much so that it often seems like we have little time for ourselves. So, the obvious obstacle to you becoming a daily reader is simply finding the time. Blogger Tu Vu has some great remedies for the time crunch, one of which is finding small gaps in the day to read a few pages. 
Maybe you're a morning person who wakes up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. If so, then consider getting up a few minutes earlier to fit 10 to 20 minutes of reading in before you go to work or school. Many people are more alert and active in the morning, making those spare minutes a perfect time to sneak in some reading. But what about those of us who just aren't morning people? Don't worry. If you can't function until you've had at least two cups of coffee in the morning, you can simply reverse the pattern. Dedicate 10 to 20 minutes after work, before dinner, or even at night when you have all the important things done. It's also important to remember that as busy as our lives are, they can also be unpredictable. Changing work schedules, family emergencies, car troubles, and a host of other unforeseeable circumstances can throw a monkey wrench into your planned reading time. But those small gaps in the day still exist. Make sure to always have a book e reader Chapter 6. Personal Knowledge Management and the Learning Process Personal knowledge management and lifelong learning have become essential for success in this ever-evolving world. Now more than ever, it's important to develop an understanding of lifelong learning principles and the skills needed for effective personal information management. Developing strategies for curating, organizing, storing, and retrieving content can help us stay ahead of change and take proactive steps toward our educational and career goals. Knowledge management gives us a solid foundation from which we can thrive on our journey toward developing our lifelong passions. Let's learn how to create your very own personal knowledge management system. Did you know that Babylonian astronomers were using geometry to calculate planetary orbits more than 3,000 years ago? Or that medieval scholars were compiling encyclopedias long before the invention of the printing press? Knowledge has always been humanity's most precious resource and one wholly essential for learning. Mankind has always understood that the greatest method to keep improving is to keep learning, which necessitates creating your own personal knowledge management system. So, what on earth is it? Personal Knowledge Management, PKM, is a collection of processes that a person employs in their regular activities to gather, classify, store, search, retrieve, and share knowledge. It's important to understand that knowledge management isn't just about collecting and organizing information. It's not just about hoarding knowledge. The ultimate goal should always be about using knowledge in a way that enhances learning and personal growth. This can involve regularly reflecting on new knowledge gained and how it relates to our existing understanding, as well as actively seeking out opportunities to apply this knowledge in practical ways. Before we get into the process of managing knowledge, it is important that we understand exactly why doing so is essential in the first place. In 1885, German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus published a groundbreaking study on memory and learning. In his research, he found that people have a tendency to forget information over time. The forgetting curve is one of the most well-known concepts to come out of Ebbinghaus's research. It shows that humans forget roughly 50% of new information within an hour and 70% within a day. The curve demonstrates how learned knowledge fades from our memories over time unless we take steps to preserve it there. We know the steepest decline in memory occurs shortly after learning, so therefore it's critical to review what you've learned as soon as possible. But how do you do that if you don't know exactly where the information is? Personal knowledge management is truly your knight in shining armor here. It enables you to delegate the task of remembering. Instead of remembering all the facts, you simply need to remember that you know it and that you know where to find it. Think of it as a system that will allow you to organize and store ideas and references as building blocks. Then... Whenever you need to start a project, you just select and assemble the necessary building components to create a finished artwork. Therefore, the less time and energy you spend on the building blocks, the more time you have to actually create something beautiful. There's really no doubt about it. We live in an age of complete information overload. 
It seems like every day you wake up and are faced with a chiming laptop signaling to us that there's 10 more. Chapter 7. Create your own personal syllabus and reflective learning. Working deeply and deliberately on a passion goal isn't always easy, especially when you don't have an outside authority or syllabus to guide your learning process. Yet the best way to truly master a topic, whether it be a new language or skill set, is to come up with your own personal syllabus and use deep work to stick with it. Go beyond simply reading through tutorials. Try out actions associated with the topic. Apply what you're learning in different contexts and take time for reflection throughout the journey. Remember, having an effective syllabus that allows room for flexibility can make all the difference when it comes to engaging with deep work. One of the biggest goals of most people in life is personal and professional development. But why do some manage to get so far while others remain in the same place without progressing in their lives and careers? Is luck the key to success? Or maybe fate? The secret to being successful in life and profession is not in chance, but in the strategies of action and in the possibilities that each one creates for himself. When obstacles appear in the way, not everyone is prepared to remove them and move on. And this process of overcoming and learning needs to be constant you don't need to wait for some external institution to impose a curriculum on you. You can set your own goals and create a program for development. Some people enroll in courses or degrees or wait for their employers to send them to get specialist training, but others don't need this permission and can take their own growth and development into their own hands. Creating a personal syllabus is the ideal way to achieve this ambition. Designing Your Personal Syllabus Let's take the real-life example of Harry, who recently graduated with a degree in computer sciences. Harry started applying for entry-level roles with several software companies. However, he's still confused about how to get on with his career. Harry's love for computer goes back to his childhood, and he's always dreamed of becoming a computer engineer. He knows that to get a job at the right place, he needs to develop expertise in at least one programming language. However, he isn't prepared to sit back and wait for the companies to call him. He wants to take control of his own personal and professional development. How can self-learning help carry land his dream job? Creating a personal syllabus is a commitment to your own development. It's a plan that systematizes various actions to be taken so that you achieve a certain goal through personal and professional development. In other words, it's a road map for you to get from where you are now to where you want to be. Or, more broadly, to become who you would like to be. As it is a real written document with goals and deadlines, your personal syllabus helps you maintain focus. By sticking to strategically considered steps, you don't get carried away by random distractions, and you're not derailed by unforeseen events. Creating your own syllabus is not easy, but it pays huge dividends for the time you invest in your personal growth. Before proceeding to set goals for your personal development, you need to know which skills you need to develop, as well as adopt a growth mindset. Some believe that they're born with a certain number or type of skills that can never be changed which implies that learning new skills is outside. Chapter 8. Passive versus Active Learning and How to Capitalize Active learning is much more intrinsically motivating than passive learning because it encourages active participation from the learner. Active learners are creating their own knowledge, connecting existing ideas, and testing them through experimentation, observation, and communication with peers. This creates an environment where students can learn in an exploratory way, feel prepared to exit their comfort zones, and build on their passions. Through these conversations and activities, students are able to develop analytical thinking as well as collaboration and self-direction skills, making it a better preparation for lifelong learning. 
By incorporating real-world lessons into your material, you give yourself an enriching educational experience that can help create impactful, life-changing events. Let's learn how you can transition to being an active learner. Jimmy had always been a curious child. He loved learning about different cultures and yearned to explore the world beyond his small town in Nebraska, but he knew that wasn't possible. His parents were struggling just to keep food on the table, so there was no money for extravagant adventures or trips out of state. But then, Jimmy's fifth-grade teacher, Mrs. Johnson, introduced her students to something wonderful, role-playing games. She explained how these games could be used as an immersive way to learn about history and other cultures from around the globe without ever leaving the classroom. Jimmy was immediately intrigued by this new form of education and jumped right into every game with enthusiasm. From pretending they were ancient Egyptians building pyramids in class to creating civilizations during medieval Europe, each adventure transported him further away from home than he'd ever dreamed possible, all while teaching important lessons of culture and history along the way. As time went on, Jimmy's knowledge grew exponentially through these role-play experiences with his classmates. His grades shot up, too. It turned out that understanding facts wasn't enough if you didn't have a real connection or sense of context behind them. By connecting emotionally with what he learned through role-playing activities, Jimmy finally got an A-plus in history class instead of another C-plus. Mrs. Johnson hadn't just taught her students about historical events. She'd also shown them how fun learning could be when done properly. Through these educational journeys filled with laughter and discovery, Jimmy found himself more excited than ever before for each new day at school, and he eventually discovered that knowledge is indeed power after all. Jimmy's story is an excellent example of how active learning strategies, such as role-playing, can make a significant impact on learning. Let's find out what active learning is and how you can have as much fun in the classroom as Jimmy did. Whether you're a student or an educator, everyone can benefit from incorporating these strategies into their learning routines. Let's begin. Active learning is a type of engaged education that encourages student participation and involvement in their own educational journey. Myers and Jones describe active learning as anything that includes providing opportunities for students to talk and listen, read, write, and reflect. Chapter 9. Gamification for Learning, Retention, and Motivation Gamification is an increasingly popular active learning strategy that can liven up any educational environment. By providing rewards and challenges, gamification keeps you engaged and motivated to learn while enlivening the atmosphere. This fun approach is based on theories of motivation, cognitive psychology, and behavioral science and promotes cooperative problem solving alongside competition. Gamification has been gaining traction in recent years as a way to boost motivation and productivity. By incorporating elements such as game-like challenges and rewards into the environment, you're more likely to stay engaged in day-to-day -day tasks. However, it's important not to forget the importance of intrinsic motivation and passion. If those factors aren't present, the initial motivating factors provided by gamification will have little long-term success. Creating an environment where people feel free to pursue their interests can foster meaningful relationships that go beyond simple challenge-based reward systems. If a strong sense of purpose exists, you're more likely to stay motivated over long periods of time, regardless of gamified elements. Let's see how you can make studying for that exam just a little bit more fun. The world of video games was a place of total escapism. For Michael, as soon as he booted up his computer and clicked on the game, he felt like he'd been transported to another realm entirely. Every detail in the game seemed incredibly lifelike, from the character's facial expressions to the sound effects that made it seem like he was really there. 
Michael found himself quickly immersed in this alternate universe where danger lurked around every corner, but also possibilities were endless. He learned how to survive through trial and error. If something didn't work out exactly as planned, he simply tried again until it did work out perfectly. This process taught him invaluable lessons about problem-solving skills and perseverance, qualities that would serve him well in real life, too. But more than anything else, what kept Michael coming back to this virtual reality was its sheer entertainment value. Whenever things got dull or stressful at home or school or work, playing these games allowed him to take a break from reality while still engaging with an exciting storyline full of puzzles and plot twists. It provided just enough distraction without completely disconnecting him from reality. Instead of vegging out on the couch, watching TV all night long, which often left him feeling even more drained, spending time gaming gave Michael a sense of accomplishment when all was said and done, because not only did he feel entertained, but also smarter after each session. At times, it almost felt surreal. Here, Michael was learning valuable lessons while simultaneously being taken away into another realm, one filled with dragons and knights and castles, but one that could actually teach us so much about ourselves, too. Gaming isn't just a way for people to escape their worries, but rather an avenue for them to learn new skill sets whilst having fun along the way. Something no other medium can quite provide. Judging from Michael's experience with video games, we can deduce that video games can be used as essential tools to improve learning, retention, and motivation. You might be wondering why on earth I'm talking about learning and video games within the same sentence. Because surely not... Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to get more information on Peter Hollins, visit bit.ly slash Peter Hollins. If you'd like more information about the podcast, visit us at newtonmg.com. 